Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome to my session HPPM Patient Blood Management Video Series. Today I'll be uh, talking about targeted aims in uh, critical care bleeding. I want, I'm sure you will be wondering why I want to talk about critical care bleeding, but it's very imperative to understand and memorize what are the targeted aims um, in managing patients whom you suspect or having risk or already receiving blood transfusion. Um, as you all know, the blood clot consists of stacks of red blood cells um, and the uh, meshwork intermingled with meshworks of um, fibrins and also uh, platelets, activated platelets, etc. to cover the area of injury. But in order to achieve a good blood clot with a good fibrinolytic activity, all the other uh, environmental factors that this blood clot is sitting in um, should be also uh, be in optimum level. So you need to um, look through the temperature, you need to control the temperature as optimum as possible, ensuring there is uh, balance in the electrolytes and combating the bacteria with antibiotics and also structural defects by means of ensuring the primary hemostasis is secured. As we have discussed earlier in the earlier video, the patient blood management um, was given a definition to improve the patient outcome. And as per Society of the Advancement of Blood Management had pointed out, it is defined as the scientific use of safe and effective medical and surgical techniques designed to prevent anemia and decrease bleeding uh, in an effort to improve the outcome. And SABM Society in 2018 had actually added on optimizing coagulation as one of the PBM elements. Indirectly, um, um, in our clinical practice, we have been um, checking the um, coagulation profile in order to have some um, idea about the secondary hemostasis. So this has been an implementation into the patient blood management program. Thus, um, one of the um, aims or the targeted aims also included in uh, the optimization of coagulation. Now, in the National Blood Authority Australia, this is the guideline uh, um, of PBM that has been uh, uh, our guide all this while. Um, and um, it is consists of um, six modules. Module 1, which is a critical bleeding or massive transfusion. Module 2 deals with the perioperative uh, bleeding. Module 3 is for the medical cases. Module 4, critical care. And obstet module 5, obstetrics and maternity. And module 6, neonatal and pediatrics. So you can um, Google uh, National Blood Authority Australia and you can get this module for free. Don't worry if you have seen that some of these models have, have been highlighted to be under review because they are always under review because a lot of new updates uh, until now and they have updated, uh, the last uh, they've updated themselves is in May this, this year. Um, so don't worry about that uh, being under review module because the gist of the, uh, uh, the things or the important things that you need to remember is that they're trying to put this module up uh, because we are planning or we need to plan up what kind of patients that we're looking at. And it is basically in uh, conjunction of the personalized medicine um, uh, way of, of treating the patient. Now, module one is quite common to all modules, honestly. And there is an inter and intra module relationship whereby sometimes we might need to use module three or the medical module into the perioperative module if the patient do have some medical problems. And vice versa, some of the uh, perioperative uh, module can be fit in into our medical patients who may need to be uh, under uh, surgery uh, for some reason, for some other reason. But what's more important is the critical bleeding or massive transfusion module is almost common to all, even up to the neonatal and pediatrics module. Now, in module two, for example, in perioperative, despite 
of the importance of defining anemia and managing it well, um, as well as ensuring the um, three pillars of PBM are, uh, are in place or implemented uh, uh, concurrently. The most um, important emphasis was given to the meticulous hemostasis during intraoperative period. So what it's trying to mean as, as uh, trying to tell us here that while intraoperatively um, this patient is under GA and the surgeons are trying to salvage um, or trying to put up with the primary hemostasis, the importance of hemostasis thrombosis or the secondary hemostasis are given high importance during intraoperative because that is quite important period for us to ensure that the primary hemostasis are also well insured and secured. Now, the um, traditional idea of um, reserving the IVC regime it must be revisited that the fact of the IBC regime is meant for patients or meant for conditions of the IBC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. We should not be using the IBC regime to all patients who are not in the IBC because that is the source of inappropriate use of blood products. And it must be understood that the IVC regime in all patients who are not in the IVC are rather a clinician focus um, um, planning rather than patient focus. And it must be made aware that this partial similarity of the IVC is actually the definition of critical bleeding that requires massive transmission where inevitably you will ignite the massive transmission protocol and it must be supervised carefully in a tight or uh, in a tight condition that the targeted aim must be achieved. Otherwise, it will lead to massive transfusion adverse effects. So that is why we need to know and memorize or understand what is the targeted aim and what is this aim for. So let's look at the module one or critical bleeding or massive transfusion. Now critical bleeding, if you put yourself into the condition where a patient having a major hemorrhage that is life-threatening and likely to result in the need for massive transfusion. So you know you are in the situation whereby the patient is having critical bleeding. Now what is massive transfusion? Now, when massive transfusion in an adult is defined as transfusion of half of one blood volume in four hours. Now, half of one blood volume here is um, uh, pertaining to the PEC cell or the red blood cells. Or the other definition is that more than one blood volume in 24 hours. Taking into account adult blood volume is approximately 70 mils per kg. So let's say the patient is 70 kilo. So that's the blood volume for the patient is 1.4 mils for that day. But if this patient are given um, 700 cc of PEC cell in four hours, the patient is already having massive transfusion as per definition. Why is it important to understand this massive transfusion is that it leads to problems in the uh, blood components or the whatever is uh, the entity of that blood within that blood it will change it will change in the electrolytes it will change in the volume there will be change in in the back in the in the composition of bacteria perhaps or even in the toxin so this does lead to um, massive transfusion adverse events, inclusive of infection. Now, if you look here, these are the common MTP um, protocol that's in place in the traumatic trauma uh, emergency or emergency department in cases of trauma. And these are the uh, flowchart of the massive transfusion protocol of which we have 
we we have uh, it is redefined um, to help in the blood loss of the patient. But what's more important is the aim, the targeted aim, which is what to optimize the oxygenation, the cardiac output of the patient, the tissue perfusion, and the metabolic state of the patient, which is the hemodynamic state. And you, you, we do need to monitor this patient rather than just give, you know, order the blood and then you just transfuse within the next two, three hours. You still need to monitor, if possible, every 30 to 60 minutes. Sometimes in, in, in view of convenience, I will go up to one to two hours. And full blood count, coagulation screen, ionized calcium and natural blood gas is one of those things that you need to monitor. And if you suspect this patient in the IVC, you can actually ask for fibrinogen, but or perhaps only for that day, for you to decide what are you going to do to that fibrinogen level when the results comes back. And the aim, the targeted aim at all times when you monitor this patient, you must ensure the patient's body temperature more than 35 degrees Celsius, ensuring the pH more than 7.2, base excess less than 6, lactate less than 4, calcium more than 1.1, platelets more than 50, PTA, PTT less than 1.5, INR less or more, same as 1.5, and fibrinogen 1 more than 1. Now the question is, why do you need to aim for these parameters? Because to optimize the coagulation, and it is generally understood as measures to control bleeding as per um, uh, a paper that was written by an anesthetist in 2007. We have to ensure that there should be no dilution or anemia because as you all know, the red cells are required for blood clot and you have to ensure the management of active bleeding is done properly and we hope to aim a target uh, HB of more than 10 grams per deciliter which is not necessary by the transfusion. Hypothermia impairs coagulation enzymes, thus reduces the platelet function and increases fibrinolysis. So we don't want hypothermia in this patient. You must avoid it but if it happens, if I mean it happens, it happens, but you have to ensure that you have done all measures possible to avoid the hypothermia. You know, to prevent acidemia. So the ABG that you did was to actually look whether there's acidemia and correct it with sodium bicarb where possible. Because it results in enzyme and platelet dysfunction if you keep the patient in uh, acidemia. And it has proven uh, pH reduction from 7.4 to 7 leads to 70% reduction of inactivation of prothrombin factor 2 and definitely it is not useful or, or, or it does cause the failure of Novo7 if you, because it reduces the activity by 90%. And, it must, and, and, and all of us must ensure to exclude local causes like incomplete ligation or cauterization. So always... Um, have communication with your surgeons. Calcium is another um, element or another electrolytes or minerals that need to be monitored because hypocalcemia can occur due to the excessive blood loss and also due to the excessive EDTA in the secretion due to massive transfusion because EDTA is calcium chelators. Why do we need to keep the calcium within normal range? Because it is an important cofactor for coagulation cascade. And if you don't correct it in timely fashion, it can cause unstoppable bleeding, which everybody thinks as the IVC. Thus, the interdisciplinary good clinical practice is to achieve the targeted aim. So these are the targeted aims that you need to understand and remember at all times when you manage patients with bleeding and blood transfusion. And these also apply for dengue hemorrhagic fever um, as to my clinical practice. So the team must exchange thoughts in ensuring good blood clot after securing primary hemostasis if we are dealing with patients with trauma or uh, patients gone uh, under the knife for surgery. And the closer the targeted aim to normal range, the better. Now remember in the previous video, 
that you should always balance the risk of bleeding and the risk of uh, thrombosis. If you find the patient have lower risk of bleeding after um, you know, keeping the targeted aim to closest to the normal range, then you need to start to think whether this patient has the risk of VTE. Because the moment bleeding stopped, all the other parameters got better. Don't forget to recalculate the VTE risk and see whether the patient requires anti-thrombotic or not. Because these are the patients that have stayed long and probably um, have been uh, prolonged stay in the hospital and uh, in bed. Uh, so that's they have a risk of VTE. So this timely, again, you need to uh, decide whether to start anti-thrombotic uh, for the patient or not in the, to reduce the risk of VTE. So with that, thank you for your attention. Please look forward for my next video. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.